Well now to tonight's studio guest, Chicago-based economist David Hale, an advisor to investment management companies in the US, Europe, Asia and South Africa, as well as Australia. David Hale, welcome to Late Line. Good evening. It does seem that everywhere you look, the global economy is facing headwinds. Yes, it is. We have oil and food prices rising rapidly, which is compelling many emerging market countries to raise their interest rates, raise bank reserve requirements to try and control credit growth. We've had interest rate hikes seven times in the last year in India, seven times in Brazil, three times in China in the last few months. We've had interest rate hikes in Thailand, Malaysia, Peru, Chile. So there's universal global monetary tightening going on in emerging market countries because of oil and food. And I suppose the oil, particularly in the developed countries, is the key at the moment, the Middle East tensions. We currently have oil around 105 US dollars a barrel. What's the outlook? Well, we don't know. It depends very much on Saudi Arabia. We've had the shocks of Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. Libya will reduce world oil output by about 1.6 million barrels, but Saudi Arabia can make that up. The big, big question for investors, for markets is, can Saudi Arabia remain stable? King Abdullah came back from three months of medical leave two weeks ago, his first day home. He announced $38 billion of new welfare spending. He's out using his money to buy votes, to buy support, to buy popular approval. And so far, Saudi Arabia appears to be stable. So the guess that markets are making is, is that Saudi Arabia will be able to use its money, its wealth, to basically buy social peace. If Saudi Arabia is a game changer, what about Bahrain? Well, Bahrain's a small country, 1.2 million people, which adjoins Saudi Arabia. And Bahrain has a very complex situation. The country has a Sunni king who's been there for, or his family has been there for 250 years, but the population is 70% Shiite, the same religion that dominates Iran. So we had disturbances six or eight weeks ago with the Shiites demanding more political and economic rights. The king initially told the crown prince, his son, to negotiate a deal. He failed. So two weeks ago, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates sent in 2,000 troops to try and basically control things. So far, there's been no unrest. The policy has worked. But I would say it stores up trouble for later because the danger with this kind of policy is it will unify the Shiite moderates and the Shiite extremists in a more extreme direction. This could play very much in favor of what Iran's intentions are, which are to basically overthrow the monarchy and create a Shiite republic. And in turn, that would have severe ramifications for Saudi Arabia. Absolutely, because Shiite, the Shiites control Saudi Arabia's eastern province, which is where the oil is produced. And Saudi Arabia took this action two weeks ago because they're very concerned that if the Bahrain monarchy made lots of concessions, it would only inflame their own population. So there's no doubt whatever happens in Bahrain is very important for Saudi Arabia. And if the market saw Bahrain getting out of control, they would once again drive the oil price higher. So if the market is currently betting that, that these countries will remain in control, and indeed it does appear at the moment that things are stable, do you think the market's right? For the time being, the market's right. But everything in Saudi Arabia is uncertain simply because the regime is so decrepit. The king is 86 years old. He's in bad health. His successor, the crown prince, is in worse health. Behind them is the, finance, is, is the defense minister, Mr. Naif. He's ultra-conservative. He's incapable of any reforms. So if we lose the king, we lose the crown prince, we get somebody who might be even more difficult to make any changes. So by definition, Saudi Arabia is simply a very, very, very difficult situation to call. It's going to be, I think, very complex and very difficult for quite some time. Someday, in the next 10 years, there'll be a new generation, a new leadership, which may be able to transform things. But that still is right now at least five or six years in the future. And, of course, Saudi Arabia is, what, 29% of total OPEC output? If... Something it's, was to happen. It's 10 or 11 million barrels out of 34 billion barrels. That's correct. So if something was to happen, what would happen to oil prices? The price of oil could double. Overnight. If we were going to lose Saudi Arabia, the price of oil could easily double to $200 a barrel. Easily. Today we saw President Obama justify U.S. involvement in Libya, but there are still very big questions about the end game and the exit strategy, if you like. What risk do you think that this crisis engulfs the administration or at the very least becomes a significant distraction? I think the administration is hoping for some good luck. I think it's hoping there'll be a military coup in Libya, that the military will rise up against Gaddafi and overthrow him because they won't want to keep fighting the NATO forces. They don't want to get bombed by NATO planes, bombed and basically have their forces uh, destroyed and basically take a lot of casualties. That's probably our hope. Will that happen? There's no way of making a prediction as to what will happen. Gaddafi's been in power for 41 years, but he's obviously highly idiosyncratic, he's highly unpredictable, and so we can't really say what's going to happen exactly given this kind of regime. He did have, a few weeks ago, major defections by ambassadors, by ministers, 
even by generals who went over to the opposition. Could it happen again? Quite easily. But there's no way to forecast that very precisely. So mm -hmm. the administration, I think, is hoping there'll be some good luck to resolve the situation over the next few weeks. Of course, uh, the US administration is dealing with some fairly pressing budget issues of its own. There's an impasse between congressional uh, Republicans and the administration. Do you think there's a, a real risk of a government shutdown? I think it's one possibility, but I take hope from the fact that John Bonner, the Republican majority leader, who's now the Speaker of the House, doesn't want a government shutdown. He knows that what happened back in 1995 when Newt Gingrich shut the government down was not good for Republicans standing in the opinion polls. So I think he'll try very, very hard over the next few weeks to try and avoid that. But it'll require him knocking heads in his own caucus. It'll require trying to get the Tea Party voters, of which there are 87 now in the Republican caucus, to basically agree to make concessions to not go for $65 billion in spending cuts immediately, maybe more like 30 or $35 billion. It's going to be a tough, tough sell, but I don't think he wants to shut the government down, so I take some hope from that fact. And where does all of this leave, I guess, the, the outlook for the economy? I mean, the U.S. has been gradually, steadily climbing out of recession. Is there a risk it could slip back? Well, we announced a big fiscal stimulus program back in December, $700 billion of tax cuts, some of them being old tax cuts renewed, others were being new tax cuts on Social Security and business depreciation allowances. And the new tax cuts will expire in December. In addition, the big Obama stimulus program enacted two years ago is now unwinding. So in the new year, 2012, there will be fiscal drag in the U.S. economy of 3.9% of GDP, independent of what the Republicans want to do on discretionary spending. So fiscal policy will be a drag on U.S. growth next year, and I believe it will bring the growth rate of the American economy from 3.5% in the second half of the year, probably down to 2% in the first quarter. How long will it be weak? We don't know yet. If it's fundamentally weak for more than a few months, we may have Ben Bernanke being forced to go for a new third version of his quantitative easing policy, a policy which is now pumping in the current time $600 billion into the markets, which is scheduled to expire in June, and it will expire in June based on current evidence. But the whole issue may be reopened next year if this fiscal drag fundamentally depresses the U.S. economy in a meaningful way. Either way, do you see the administration working to avoid slipping back into recession? Of course. Nobody wants to go back into recession in an election year. But will they succeed? Yes. There's no danger of recession because the American economy is having a good recovery based on a spectacular recovery in corporate profits. We're getting good gains in capital spending because of profit growth. We're now getting gains in employment because of profit growth. We're also getting tremendous gains in exports because we had, with our huge job losses two and three years ago, tremendous gains in productivity. So there's no danger of recession. The danger is simply growth could go from 3.5% down to 1.5% or 2%. Not a recession, but a slowdown. What about China in this region, seemingly addicted to double-digit growth? China is now confronting a major inflation problem. The inflation rate is 5% plus, and so China has in the last five months raised interest rates three times. They've raised bank requirement, reserve requirements several times. I believe they'll raise interest rates again this year probably three or four times and also raise bank reserve requirements again. China will slow down. The growth rate of the Chinese economy over the last five years has been 11.2%. The growth rate this year will be 8 or 9%. So that would amount to a gentle tapping of the accelerator. You don't see any risk that that tap could turn into a thud, that when you stop this momentum, it risks a train crash. I think over three to five years, other forces are changing in China, which could dampen growth. First of all, China now has a labor shortage. It's leading to a lot of wage inflation. Wage gains last year were 20%. They could be 20% again this year. This could set the stage for a squeeze on Chinese corporate profit margins. China is also now experimenting with interest rate liberalization, allowing for the first time competitive bidding for bank deposits. China's had two things driving its boom over the last 10 years, cheap labor and a low cost of capital. If they now do liberalize interest rates, they could rise quite significantly, raise the cost of capital. That also could depress capital spending. That could change the whole Chinese growth mix, less investment and rise the consumption share of GDP, which would be a positive. That's a necessary rebalancing, but it could, going out five years, bring China's growth rate down from 8 or 9% to maybe 7 or 8%. But less investment, is that a warning bill for countries like Australia that supply raw materials? It means that there'll be a change in China's demand. There'll be less demand for raw materials and more spending on things like services. So it'll be a mild negative for Australia. But at the same Only time... Only a mild negative? But at the same time, you have countries like India now just embarking upon the urbanization process. India is only 30% urban. China is 45% urban. So I could see coming out of India over the next five or 10 years a tremendous new demand for raw materials as well. 
The question is, will Australia have competition in satisfying this demand? Well, in, in terms of that competition, China's been very active in investing in its own mines around the world. Do you see it actively working to try and break that cartel, I guess, for want of a better word, in iron ore, which is Australia and Brazil, really, in essence? There's a great opportunity now for China to break the cartel, and that opportunity lies in West Africa. There have been major discoveries over the last two or three years of huge new iron ore deposits all over West Africa, in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, and Australian companies have played a very active role in this. Right now, there are about 25 new mines to open over the next five years. By 2015, they could be producing 620 million tons of iron ore per annum. Global iron ore trade last year was 930 million tons. This is a huge increase in supply. That's four years away. Four years away. Is that realistic? Yes, it is. And this could set the stage for undermining the cartel that RTZ, BHP, and Val in Brazil have had over the iron ore price in recent years. And Australia is part of this boom, though. There are many small Australian iron ore companies playing a role in this, but they have no capital. They're underfunded. And guess where they're going for capital? China. Good example, Sundance Resources, major discovery in Cameroon. They just signed a deal a few months ago to get $1.5 billion of Chinese capital to develop the mine. RTZ is developing a major mine in Guinea, the Sindulu Project. Guess who's helping to finance it? Chinalco in China. So we're going to have, I think, in West Africa, a lot of Australian and Chinese synergy to develop these iron ore projects. But the reality is there's lots of Australian companies in Africa, 140 altogether, but they're very small companies. Their market caps are 20, 30, 40 million dollars. They need capital from somewhere, and guess where they're going to find it? In China. And when you're talking about those sorts of, of tonnages coming out of West Africa, what does that mean for the price long term? What does it mean for things like Australia's mooted mining tax? I think it means the price of iron ore is going to decline in five years' time. How much? We don't know. But I would guess at least 20 or 30 percent. And that means the mining tax won't produce as much revenue as the government might now be projecting if they assume iron ore prices stay high indefinitely. Just a, a final question. The Australian dollar hit 103 US cents overnight. Should we fear a higher currency? Well, it was announced over the weekend a German auto, auto parts company is going to close its factories in Melbourne. You will be squeezing parts of this Australian economy which are in the tradable goods sector. You might also dampen the flow of foreign students here because it becomes expensive to come here. Victoria last year had $5.5 billion of revenue from foreign students. If they can't afford to come to Australia, you'll lose that revenue. So there will be losers. And the question is, will the losers outnumber the winners? Right now, because the mining boom is so vast and so great, all the focus is on that. But there will be casualties, and they will take a toll on the Australian manufacturing sector, taking a toll on the Australian vineyards, who have higher prices as well, taking a toll on education. So there will be trade-offs. But there are two or three things driving the Australian dollar. One is high commodity prices. The second is weakness in the U.S. dollar, caused by the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing policy. Over the last five months, emerging market central banks have not liked this Federal Reserve policy. They've been boycotting the U.S. Treasury market. When the Fed ends this policy in June, I'm hoping that emerging market central banks will once again be buying Treasury securities. If they do, there could be a 4 or 5% rally in the U.S. dollar and take the Australian dollar back to 97, 98 cents. That's my hope for July, August, and September. No guarantees, but that's my hope if the Federal Reserve ends this quantitative easing policy. The factors driving the Australian dollar are not just Australian. They're also global liquidity, global capital flows tied to this Federal Reserve monetary policy. David Hale, many thanks for taking us around the world and giving us your insights. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.